So my name's Jude Berger and I want to talk to you today about food intolerance. It's something that's near and dear to my heart. I've been looking at it myself for quite some time. Um, by food intolerance, um, I'm talking about how our bodies just aren't able to process all of the chemicals that we eat in today's modern diet and um, that some of us have effects which you wouldn't necessarily tie to food. Um, and why I want to talk about anxiety, depression and anger is because these are things that happen to me. So when I was um, young, all the way through to my 20s, um, I would have these fits of depression and some of them would just be absolutely debilitating and I'd have to lock myself in my bedroom and couldn't talk to anyone or else I'd just be really irritated and I wouldn't be able to control just the level of aggression that was inside me or there'd be this low level anxiety and so I had quite a long time, many, many, many years of, of these issues and not really understanding what was going on. But it was to the point where it was affecting decisions I was making in my life. Do I go to this party? Do I accept this thing? If, if, if my mood is so um, bad and unknowable, then I can't really manage the things around me. And it affects relationships and stuff like that as well. So for me, it was a real problem and I wanted to address it. And somehow I came across um, um, some information about uh, how food can affect mood and I thought that was really odd. Um, but on the other hand, it did kind of make some sense because um, I did notice that if I did a big junk food binge or if I'd gone to a Chinese restaurant or something like that, um, a cheap Chinese restaurant, then I would have issues. So what I did was an elimination diet and that elimination diet showed me categorically um, that the issues that affect me are certain additives that are added to foods, um, preservatives, benzoates, sorbates, um, MSG um, and also glutamic acid are the things that affect me. So um, what I wanted to do today was talk to you about um, how that can come about. So. Um, during my research over the years, both for myself, um, my own issues and for other people in my life, their issues, um, what I've found out is that there are things as common as salicylates and amines. So in addition to the food chemicals that I've just talked about, there are also naturally occurring chemicals that are known as salicylates and amines. And salicylates are found in fruits very commonly, so ripe fruit. Um, can be a trigger for uh, food intolerance. Same with amines, um, and you can find amines uh, particularly in aged meats and chocolate and eggplant and, and those kind of chemicals. So for people who are big meat eaters, um, it, it tends to be uh, common, I've seen, that men who are big meat eaters and who then get into a funk are often very sensitive to amines. Um, and the salicylate reaction seems to be one of the most common things that happens in children. So it can be a, um, a temper tantrum, it can be um, a, a crazy um, inability to concentrate or, a, or a, just a head banging, th these kinds of things. Um, some people have even talked about autism and ADHD and OCD symptoms being improved by a food intolerance diet. And when I say some, I'm talking like thousands. So this is actually quite a well-known phenomena these days. Um, it's just not as well known in the mainstream. And that's why I came out to Bar Camp today to talk about it. Um, now the problem with um, identifying food intolerances is that it's not always an immediate reaction. So sometimes when kids have an, uh, go to a party and go crazy, people eat immediately say, well, that's because of all the, um, the, the food that they've been eating or the red cordial or something like that. And while that can well be the case, it's also often um, the additives that are in the foods that are, are turning the kids a bit crazy. But on the other hand, there are chemical additives and depending on your own chemical makeup that can take up to 48 hours or even longer to show a response. So if you ate something two days ago and you only start getting the reaction today, it can be really hard to link those two together. And if you are thinking food, you're more likely to think about what you ate this morning as opposed to what you ate two days ago. So um, uh, 
salicylates, amines, free glutamates um, and uh, additives, um, which is, I guess, less of a surprise to some people given the, the explosion of additives that we now see in our diet these days. So for me, hallelujah, I'm solved, I'm fixed, I'm, it's terrific. Um, what I wanted to do was just, do you, just put up your hand, do you or anyone you know think that maybe your unexplained depression, anxiety, brain fog, confusion, just not quite all the synapses working, do any of you think that maybe you or someone in your family might have an issue? Is that why you've come in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and thanks for doing that. Um, I think it is something that, uh, that isn't getting the level of press that it needs. Um, there are a number of scientific studies available. So people go, this, yeah, this is a bit woo-woo. Um, but there are a number of scientific studies available. The site that helped me the most was fedup.com. And they have dozens of um, websites and papers and all that kind of thing against um, how food chemicals can affect you. And for instance, the, there's a, pardon? Yeah, so fedup.com.au. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah, W's at the front. Yeah. Um, yeah, fedup.com.au. Yeah. For people who are basically fed up. And there are, um, like, so for instance, there's, there's one set of stories about depression and there's 90 pages of success stories from individuals who've written in a paragraph or more just about how the diet has benefited them. So it's, it's a huge... Um, it's a huge issue. It's, 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 there are thousands of people that have been improved. Fed up has 10,000 members itself. Um, so how the elimination diet works in order to find out once and for all if you do in fact have issues is, there's no surprise, you, you bring your diet back down to some very basic whole food vegetables, um, rice and chicken and, and f fresh fish, those kinds of things. You eat those for a couple of weeks. Now, it sounds tough, it is tough, um, but for those two weeks, you then learn whether or not it's even an issue for you. If you feel exactly the same, you're still getting your issues, you know, um, then you can say, okay, it's not food intolerance and you can go back to your normal diet. But if you do respond, then the trick comes in. Then you have to start working out, okay, so what's the trigger? And then you start adding additives back in. And by additives, I'm including chemical additives, um, normal food additives. So food chemicals, sorry. So you might bring in salicylates, fruits, and then you bring in the fruit family and you can see what happens. Now, often, often the thing that you're addicted to the most is the thing that's actually causing the issue. So there'll be kids, for instance, who adore fruit and you go, I'm so grateful that my kid loves fruit. You know, it's like there's no problem getting my kid to eat fruit. But the kid has eczema and asthma and has tantrums and hits their head on the wall and those kind of things, then you can point to the fruit. Excuse me. So when you do the elimination diet, you pick which food chemicals you want to bring in. And then you, do, you, 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 you slowly increase the amount of um, salicylates or amines or whatever that you're testing to see whether or not you um, can tolerate a certain level and then bang, you get a, you'll get a response. So you can work out, okay, salicylates are an issue for me and then you add in amines and then you, you might have chosen to d include gluten and dairy and those kinds of um, other substances in your diet. And so then you start noticing how long your, the diet can take because you need a week to fully test a certain chemical substance and then see how that's going. So um, it's obviously well worth it uh, for me because once you know once and for all, then there's um, a benefit. Now, some people who are extra sensitive also have to do things like um, toothpaste, shampoo, um, moisturiser, um, because our chemicals can get absorbed in our skin. And salicylates in particular is um, very commonly found in our soaps and sulfates and um, the, the, sorry, shampoos that include things like sulfates as well. So, so that's something that, that needs to be, um, yeah, that you need to be careful of on the elimination diet. But I like to think that if in those first two weeks when you've been strictly on the elimination diet and you feel a thousand percent better, then you know that there's a food issue there. If there's no food issue, then you go back to your normal diet 
But if you do feel better, then it's like, okay, there's something for me here. Yeah. Um, so the elimination diet in its strictest form, say two weeks, if, you're, if you do it properly, like thoroughly to the letter, um, and then extending, added, adding things slowly takes, inevitably there are mistakes. Because what happens is, you know, if it's for yourself, you're hungry, you're out, it's like, oh, I'm just going to have this or I'm just going to do this. And then, you know, life gets in the way. So then you have to kind of go back and then add a week. So... I'd say three months in total, but, but after those two weeks, you are absolutely increasing your, um, your food repertoire out there. You, you, well, if you want to eliminate, if you want to el eliminate gluten and dairy as well, you end up with quite a restricted diet. So your, your, your chicken, rice, um, okra, leek, um, pears, um, there's a few there's a few other things as well but it's a, it's a very fresh fish um fresh meat like freshly killed meat um are, are some things that you can add on so you have to sort of source those things but uh pears is the only um there's one apple that you can have and pears a certain pear that you can have are the only fruits that you can have on the on the strict elimination diet um and then you can slowly add other items but they're the information's on the fed up site the information's in royal prince alfred um, hospitals food intolerance unit and I've also got more information on my ebook that um, I'll mention later um, yeah so then there's treatment okay so once you find out okay so I'm particularly I'm particularly sensitive to salicylates or I'm particularly sensitive to 281 which is a common bread preservative which was a killer for me um, what next? Uh, easy to avoid things like a bread preservative. It's easy to um, have a look at the label and see if 281 is not there. Um, but the bit that I'm on right now is that I'm looking at how to heal my system um, because I've also um, needed to become gluten free um, and I really miss my sourdough bread. So <laughs> um, I'm looking at trying to heal the situation so that I'll be able to um, increase my uh, food intake um, options. So there are th different things that they can do. There's something called leaky gut, and there's a, there's a growing body of thought that what's happening is that due to the antibiotics that we've had and, and the um, chemical diet that we've um, had with all the new additives and um, added man-made artificial chemicals that they've had over the years, that there's um, 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 increased permeability within the gut. Um, which means that there are more food molecules leaving the gut and moving to other parts of our body than they're used to. So they're looking at things like healing, healing the gut. So that's one thing to do. Um, another one is looking at metal imbalances. So copper, zinc, that magnesium, and making sure that our minerals are sufficient in our bodies in order to help um, everything work correctly, particularly for neurological issues like the ones that I've been talking about. Um, so the microbiome, so whilst we're talking about having a, um, a leaky gut, there's also the antibiotics that have been killing many of the good flora, many of the good bacteria that we've got in our belly, and you'll see um, like much more information these days on the microbiome. And whilst the bacteria in our bellies technically aren't us, without them we'd die, and making sure that our microbiome is super healthy is something that um, increasing number of mainstream doctors are including as part of their diet. And another treatment is faecal transplant. So this is where it gets really interesting. <laughs> so because our microbiome isn't, isn't strong in many of us and um, because of the diets that we're eating in the, in, the, in the world these days, many of our elimination cycles, our digestive cycles aren't healthy. So many of us don't poop in a healthy fashion and that reflects an unhealthy microbiome and thank you <laughs> there's a um, there's a, a strong um, movement now and looking at fecal transplant and that literally is as it sounds you get a healthy person's poop and you put it up your own clacker and uh, <laughs> and what that does is it introduces the healthy flora that uh, repopulate the gut um, and then you're in a better position a couple of weeks um, or, or so later on. And people have been um, brought back from the brink of death using this um, treatment, believe it or not. You do the research. New York Times is um, writing a whole heap of articles about it over the last few months. It's quite interesting. Uh, fecal transplant. Yeah. And it might have the word protocol on the end of it. 
So, um, so yeah, so I've got my five minute warning, which is basically questions. But before I do, um, I've written a book because not enough people know about this. Um, so foodandmoodbook.com, um, Twitter, at Food and Mood Book, and also on Facebook. So questions? Just say those names again. Yep, can you read that or not? No, okay, so uh, foodandmoodbook.com, so spelled foodandmoodbook.com, and then Twitter, Food Mood Book, and on Facebook, it's the Food and Mood Book as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so one thing that concerns me a little bit about the elimination diet is that your sample size is basically one. It's just you that's doing the elimination on that one. Yep. Have you ever um, uh, challenged any of these uh, specific intolerances with a, with a placebo? You know, had somebody else you know, give you a, uh, a placebo? I would absolutely sign up for that because I know that some people need that. Um, but for me, the reaction is so clear that I don't personally need to test a placebo, but I would do that because I recognise that's needed. Now, everyone's chemical makeup is different, so I might react to the bread preservative 281 um, and other people don't. But for me, I don't need convincing. I get that there are some people that think, you know, come on, or like the MSG has gone through a thing. For me, it's more free glutamic acid. So you've got unbound glutamine and you've got bound glutamine, the two different types of glutamic acid. And for me, it's the unbound glutamic acid that has a problem, but the bound glutamic acid, which is in proteins, I don't have a problem with. But that's just trial and error. Like I, I thought that it was dairy and it ended up being aged cheese. And it, like I was okay with yolk. And it's like, so the, the, the level of, um, um, assessment that you need to do can be quite obviously um, technical, whatever, but yeah. happily sign up. But so there are any risks with this approach? With the elimination diet? No, yeah. because you're still getting your full nutritional component in that two week mm -hmm. time frame, and then it's just basically adding stuff on from there. So, is there any risk? I would say the risk is in not knowing rather than doing it. Yeah. Have you considered uh, when you're on just the core elimination diet, rather than introducing specific foods back in, introducing the isolated compounds instead? Hard to buy salicylate or amine or 281. <coughs> it's hard to buy some of these things on their own, but it would be great if you could because then you could do an isolated chemical. So, for instance, if you have meat. Research labs, so yeah. Who would have access and they might actually be fit into like, yeah. MSG as well. Yeah, MSG is easy. Yeah, it's the shops. You can buy MSG. Yeah, yeah. MSG is easy. Any other questions? Can I just like a comment yeah. in a very minor fashion? Yeah. Um, we used to drive from Canberra to Adelaide and take two days and we had two little kids in the car and you can imagine two days worth of driving with two little kids. If we went and bought food in um, shops along the way, yep. fast foodie things, the children were atrocious. If we packed our own food, which meant that they weren't eating those sorts of things that you yep. talked about, yep. they were much more pleasant human beings. Yep. So if you're going on a long drive with small children, think about doing <laughs> taking this approach. <laughs> yeah. And, and like the fruit thing is a real, because people go, I feed my kids a healthy diet because I talk about food intolerance and how it can affect, oh, I feed, you know, we have a healthy diet in my house. It's not about a healthy diet. In some houses, you know, Mars bars, whatever, it's all good. Um, so like I can have plain potato chips, it's not a problem. Great, you know, there's no problem with, it's not about healthy food, it's about the right. So salicylates and amines are absolutely in healthy food, but can particularly older men, some for some reason, just... The amines get them every time, and I'm, and I'm sure I've written an article about it on my blog. Was um, that recent violence that we're having in Sydney? Um, it's like, it, um, you know, amine reaction. It's like that level of violence. But anyway, uh, I was going to ask the um, all the mass media around sugar. Yeah. Uh, all the yep. All, it, it seems to be this is not at that level of attention. Um. 
yeah, look, the, there's, a, there's a lot of talk about refined sugar, particularly it's more about refined sugar, um, about how that is a real issue for people. And if people feel that they are addicted to sugar, um, then I think doing a sugar-free diet is a really great way to assess whether sugar is an issue for you. Um, how long would that diet take to result in a change in something? Um, uh, absolutely. And it also depends on... Um, like, are you really quitting sugar or are you just not putting sugar in your coffee anymore? Like, like Coke there's zero a... Sugar. Sorry? Coke zero instead of yeah, exactly. So Coke saccharin, aspartame. Yeah. So... <laughs> absolutely. I'm no... F aspartame doesn't work for me. Like, I have issues with aspartame. So... Yeah, me neither. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so some people say um, the aspartame, artificial speakers elicit the same response um, in terms of insulin. Yeah. Um, regardless of how sugar or not. The payoff is you might be consuming less calories, but yeah. your body still produces a yeah. certain amount of insulin. Yeah, it's a fascinating field and, and it's really difficult to get the money needed in order to test particularly healthy foods. Um, but, the, but the evidence, for instance, in the 10,000 members that have signed up to the Fed Up website, it's, a very, it's very strong. And if you follow these people on, on the Facebook page, um, Sue Dengate is the person who set this up. I mean, it's very clear. Like the, 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 the number of six, like someone just wrote last night that she's weeping with joy because after being on this diet for just a couple of weeks, all of a sudden, you know, her child can do his homework and he sits pleasantly and he goes to bed and, you know, all those kinds of behaviours have just disappeared. So, and my time's up, I think. So any last question? Thank you very much for your time.